Hey, welcome everybody. John Alexander with you again for another Deep Dive podcast. Uh, tonight, I'm pretty excited because I'm bringing um, on a commercial property expert. And he's really my go-to person. I've been uh, really connected with him now for a little bit. and and um, But the uh, people that referred me to him originally, as most of the people on my podcast, we go back many, many years, some of them back to the 90s, in this case, 90s. And so he came at a really high recommendation. I got in, checked out his stuff, and was just blown away. I saw some of the stuff that he was doing also once I got a little bit more into what he was doing. And I had a whole nother level of saying, oh, my God, th this guy is like taking out all the work to doing commercial deals. So uh, his name is Neil Timmons, and I'm going to go ahead and bring him on. Neil, are you there? John, how are you? Hey, Neil, good to see you. It's good to see you. Thanks for having me on. Hey, look, I, I've been looking forward to this because, you know, commercial is like, it's heating up right now because everybody's talking about it. And uh, as the market's changing, I want to talk about to, to you uh, tonight about the market changes that we're going through and, you know, where uh, commercial starts to fit into that. And, and what really got me, you know, looking in, and I looked at a bunch of commercial uh people who were involved in commercial to see, okay, well, wait a minute, who do I want to kind of hook my, uh, my, uh, my, uh, down here in Texas, we hook a trailer. So who yeah. do I want to <laughs> hook my trailer to <laughs> take this trip? And uh, you really just kept getting recommended. So what I wanted to do was um, uh, talk to you tonight about what it is that you're doing and uh, why people maybe should get involved in commercial right now. Because I remember when I was, um, I accidentally just fell into my first commercial deal. I mean, I wasn't even really flipping houses yet uh, when I got my first mobile home park and my first apartment complex. I hadn't even done the houses yet. So most people, they go from houses to to commercial, and I kind of fell in backwards. Went the, went the other way. When, when was that? When was your first one? Uh, this was back in the 80s. All right. Uh, Mid-80s. Yeah. Yeah. So it was right after a crash. So what I remember... Right. And why I really started looking now because of what the market's changing is it, it was so easy. It was like it was easier than houses. So I wanted to bring you on tonight and talk to you about, you know, what's going on. And first of all, what's going on in, in your uh, opinion? What's going on in the marketplace right now that is going to make commercial properties something that home flippers should be looking at? Yeah, no, that's a good question. You know. I think there's a couple of things going on in the market. You know, one of the things that you just said is, you know, you were, you did your first one in the eighties, right on the backside of, of, you know, an economic downturn. And I think that's what's coming for us. I don't think we're quite there yet, which means now the opportunity to get, to get educated so that when things do get a little tougher and they'll get a little tougher in the commercial market, the interest rates on the commercial side have almost doubled since December. I mean, we've had dramatic moves in the in the interest rates and the ten-year treasury, and they, which largely impact the commercial side. Um, since December, I think what we're what we're in right now is you know we're probably technically in a recession, and I think what's coming is tremendous opportunity for folks who who have their eyes open and know how to take advantage of of opportunity. And I think it doesn't necessarily mean like things are going to be bad and all of a sudden there's a there's a problem and everything's falling apart. Let me let me get an example of of just one that wouldn't fall into that category, John. So when there's a whole bunch of people who have gone out and bought apartments in the last handful of years, right? Apartments have been very hot, fair to say, right? Certainly in the Texas where you hail from, Texas and all the way through the Sun Belt, there's tons of people moving there. And what I consistently see is there's a, there's a bunch of people will go buy an apartment deal, they'll underwrite the apartment deal, and then they'll bake in and project out a whole bunch of rental rate increases. So here's where you know, there's a whole bunch of people, you know, let's make it up. They're in Texas, right? There's a whole bunch of people moving to Texas and in rates on rents are going to move up 5% every year for the next five years. And all of a sudden the rents five years from now are going to be dramatically higher and our building's going to be worth so much more. Well, here's the thing. What happens if that's not true? What happens if as a result of inflation causing a slowdown on the housing side, just a temper in pricing, not a, not a big downturn, but a temper in pricing. What happens if that also tempers the rent rates? Well, what's going to happen is that when they that five years from now and, and a building has to either reappraise for a refinance or that person, you know, the, put, put this structure together now is up on a business plan. And five years 
from now, they intended to sell the property and that's how they set all their investors up. Well, when they got to do that and evaluate it, prices look very different. And now they're going to have to make a decision. Do they have to put money into a deal? Perhaps it doesn't appraise as strongly, or maybe they got to sell the deal. Then they put that into the market and that creates opportunities for, for buyers. So that's where you, basically you're coming in at and, and uh, the people basically learning your technique. That's where they might have the opportunity then. Yeah, the opportunity is this, that you, you learn how to take advantage of what's transacting, what's transpiring in a, in a commercial real estate environment. And the big difference is this, that, you know, I call, I call what we do, you know, we're 20Xing it. Not Grant Cardone times two, but really what we're doing is, you know, you can do a house, which I've done, I've literally been involved in almost 2,000 house transactions. Or you can do, you know, you can do 20 houses or you can do one commercial property. So we're just offsetting, you know, we can get to our, at the end of the day, our goals, our financial goals to achieve financial freedom faster, really just using a different avenue. Okay. And so do you think also, because uh, I've, I've always taught this because I've been through four crashes myself. I, right. I, I'm sure you've been through at least one or two yourself. Yeah. Yeah. And do you, do you tend to also, uh, teach that it's a good idea on the front end of a potential crash to wholesale and on the then once you get the prices lowered where you need to then you buy it and, and, and on the way up obviously buy and hold is that your strategy no it's a good question you know what i teach people to do is this is, is identify you know first where to buy and it largely i encourage folks buy in your backyard nobody knows your backyard better than you it's a lot easier to buy there than to go across the country to a city you've never been in just because some little report said it's a hot market. Start with the relationships you've got, the properties you know, the properties you already drive by. Odds have it you're already driving by deals every day you haven't even paid attention to. From there, decide on an asset class. You know, for some for some folks, um, apartments are really attractive. For others, it's self storage, it's mobile home parks. I, I teach seven different asset classes because I buy in my backyard, Des Moines, Iowa. And I'll buy anything in my seven asset classes that I really deem uh, to be valuable. I want to understand how to how to value a property and understand how to take advantage of an opportunity that may fall into my lap. That it may just may just if the phone may just ring and it may be there. I want to take advantage of that. And from there, it's making a decision on who's their perfect seller. So what I call it is our is a, what I teach is my one hundred thousand dollar seller avatar, our perfect seller. Because every check we do, every deal we should be doing, we should be making $100,000 at least on a commercial property. And so for some folks, it's deciding to wholesale a property because sometimes it's just, it's perfect seller adjacent. How about that? It meets most of the criteria, but not all. Well, that's a terrific, the perfect opportunity to sell a deal off the, and, and cash a big check and save that dollars, those dollars and cents for a deal you do want to take down. And if you get a perfect seller and you get a perfect situation for yourself, terrific. Lock up the financing, lock up that deal, and and just stay in it for for the long haul. Stay in it for the ride because all those ups and downs along the way, you know, if you stay in it, we we always end up in a better spot in the long run. Right, right. I mean, passive income you can't beat it. So, uh, so you're saying basically do both. Yes, absolutely do both, and that's exactly what I what I and this is much like you, John. I actually do what I teach, right? So I actually do these things. And when I go through and, and show folks about what I do, I, I show them, hey, here's a deal that we wholesaled, we sold off in the open market, and here's exactly what made, and here's why we sold it. Here's why we didn't keep it, right? And here's another deal that we kept, and here are, here are all the buckets for us, all the, all the green lights that it lit up and ultimately became a buy for us. Perfect. So let me, let me go back now. So I kind of got an idea of, the marketplace and kind of what we're facing. Yeah. But you said you uh, you started out in in uh, flipping homes first. Is that what you did? You know what my my background is. I started in 2004 actually as a as a realtor. My uh, so the story the story goes this. You know before that I was I worked at Wells Fargo. I was a banker. Fine company. Learned a lot of things. My mom comes to me one day and we we're just chatting. Uh, I'm the eldest of, of four boys and. She had raised all of us and it was time for her to, to go back into the workforce. And we were just chatting. She's like, I don't know what I want to do. And I said, you should be a realtor. I said, you've been dragging us to open houses, mom, for like ever since we were kids and you love people. So we just married the two houses and houses and people. And she thought about it for just a few seconds. She's like, you know what? I'm going to do that. Now, fast forward a year 
And we're, we're chatting. She's a year into the business. She makes twice what I make of me working at Wells Fargo. And I said, okay, well, I, I come from a very competitive family. So I said, you know what? If you can do that, I can do better. So that was my first, that was my entry point into real estate is I went and became a realtor. I love that story. If you, if you can do that, I can do better. <laughs> That's how I got started. I said the same thing with my dad. He got me started. And, and I said, well, if he can do it, I can do a lot better. I love it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So it's a, um, so you basically um, came in and started flipping homes for a while. And what made you, what was the light bulb moment when you switched from, or maybe just added on, it sounds like, added on commercial? Yeah. So that, that moment, it was about four years ago, plus or minus. I had been, I've done everything, John. Fixed and flipped, literally uh, hundreds. Uh, wholesale, wholesale, novation, owner finance. Um I mean, I've done, I've done it all. And, and then, you know, when I got to the point where things were very good, I made a lot of money in all those avenues, but you know, outside of owner finance, they're all one-time paydays. Yeah. They're all, you do it once. And if you want to, you want to make more, you, know, you just got to do more. Yeah. And so I was at a point where I was like, you know what, I, I need some passive income. I, I want to build wealth, not just, not just generate cash that I can send, you know, 40 some odd percent to the government for, I actually want to build some wealth. And so I thought to myself, you know, coming out of single families, being involved in the single family industry as long as I have, I thought, you know what? Single family homes, single family homes have to be my route to go. Single family homes equal passive income. So I went down the single family path. I started buying house after house after house, bought a ton of them. Um, and one thing after another would happen, right? Only the, the AC would go out, but never my own house, only at a rental house. Things would break. You know, tenants, I, I mean, I literally like the fifth house I ever bought, the tenant moved out. I bought it on a Friday. She moved out on Sunday. She'd been there five years. I, I bought it, went over, introduced myself. She moved out two days later. I thought, well, man, <laughs> there, there is something wrong with me. Um, so, I mean, I've had everything happen. I had a property management company. Uh, I brought them on thinking, you know, somebody's got to be able to do a better job than I can. You know, every everything that would break, they'd spend two or three times what I would ever spend to replace anything. Fire them, get somebody else. They spend my money like I was going out of style. Uh, fire them, got somebody else, transfer my big portfolio. And they didn't know. They, they contacted me five weeks after transferring everything to them, after they're managing my property and said, hey, what's going on with this house? And I said, what do you mean what's going on? They said, well, I, I, I mean... Are you selling this? Like, I, I don't know what's happening. I said, well, you're managing it. They said, oh, man, well, this got lost in the shuffle. We just, uh, this is an empty house. We just haven't been there. And the city just notified us that the grass is two feet tall. And that's how, that's how this came on our radar. They literally forgot they were managing my property. And so I've, I've had it all happen. So one day, uh, about four years ago, I got introduced to a commercial property. And it been just presented with an opportunity from a commercial broker. And, and, you know, it's industrial property, about 18,000 square feet, and it's, it's got a tenant in it, long-term tenant. And I thought to myself, looked at the old deal over, and I've been through, you know, I've analyzed everything you could possibly imagine. I, I've got a finance degree. And so, like, going through numbers is kind of exciting for me. And so, I've analyzed it. I analyzed it. I analyzed it. You know, and all these little thoughts would creep into the back of my head, John. Uh, you know what? I don't know if this is for you, Neil. Uh, you didn't grow up in this. Maybe this is for somebody with better connections, more money. Maybe this isn't for you. Maybe you should just pass on this. And the one thing I was sure about, even, you know, thinking of all those negative things, I call it Eeyore thoughts. All those Eeyore thoughts was what I'm doing now is not going to get to me, not going to get me where I want to go. So something's got to change. Yeah. So with that, I literally pulled the trigger, bought the property, like three months went by. And I literally thought to myself, you know what? I never hear from these people, these tenants. I never hear from these tenants. And I was the property manager. And that's when the light bulb moment was like, you know what? I'm on to something here. Totally different than single family homes. Night and day different. Night, Night and day. day. Yeah. yeah. That, I mean, past, the money's good. Don't get me wrong. And uh, the money's great. It's the life that you get because of how easy it is, the lifestyle. It's the balance between all the things that I think most of us set out for to accomplish in this business, in real estate. That's why I mean by this business in the first place. We want passive income, but we got to have our time because it just having just having this passive income you don't really have to work for. Um, 
you know, if I, if somehow I, that's not really true, I got to go work all the time to manage the passive income. Like what I was finding in single family homes, which also, well, I mean, the reality was single family homes is anything but passive. There was nothing passive about it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I found out the same thing, the, the same hard way you did and, and just divorced myself from it. Uh, but the idea though, of me basically going up a stage is what we're doing right we're going up to this yeah. commercial which is a lot more professional the the tenants are more professional correct i mean their job or their business depends on that place so they're not like somebody can say hey i can just move out and and blow correct. Off the deal. yeah yeah no i mean their 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 credits on the line they you're right their ability to produce income is derived from that that operating that space that they occupy even the leases I know are are tighter because if they break a lease, that's a company with bank accounts and money, right. and you yes. can actually force them to pay the rest of that lease. It's like not like they can. It's not like an individual that can get away with something if, if that ever happened. By the way, has that ever happened to you? Never. Never, right? No. Yeah. No. Not to say it because won't, right? You do this. You do this long enough. Yeah. But yeah. It, and it depends on who you, who your tenants are, what type of properties you're 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 in. Uh, but yeah. no, never, never have I had it happen. And I've had plenty of tenants move out. The one I just described is one, but I've had plenty of tenants just decide not to pay. Like, it's just, it's just like, it's optional. Yeah. Yeah. For, for, for on houses, houses, on houses. For, yeah. Yeah. For houses. Yeah. It's, it is optional. Yeah. Because right. there's a million houses out there. They can just go, go move into another one. And that's not the case in business. No. So uh, speaking of that, um, you know, we've had this COVID thing and now we've got these offices right up the street. I, there's a whole office building completely vacant. Yeah. Uh, what What is your take on that? Is that something that, you know, we should be going after or is that something we should avoid? Yeah, no, good question. You know, one of the things I teach to folks is um, we've got to do a couple of things. So office, you're right, has been has been badly beaten down. So should we buy it? The, the answer is maybe. There's a couple of things that have to be accounted for. So what's the vacancy? Meaning, in your example, you know, the vacancy is 100%. Well, what's the market vacancy? What kind of demand is there? How long is it going to take to fill that vacancy? What are we going to have to pay for that? And that's something I teach folks. And it's it's far simpler than what I just said. It's literally getting a couple pieces of data, put into a little spreadsheet. It's going to spit back some answers for us. And then we, at the end of the day, we want to make decisions on, on data, not drama, right? We want to make decisions from from a, a factual point uh, and then ultimately take action and move that way so that's a great question because i get asked that a lot specifically about office i get asked it a lot yeah because i just can't i can't help but think there's a lot of offices that are i mean i'm seeing a lot of vacancies out there in offices and um i know also historically the people who make the most money are the ones who buy the the you know the cheapest deal because they are absolutely in a bloodbath uh, but maybe at what point do you buy that? Is it now or is it maybe six months down the road, a year down the road? Yep. No, if you, you know, one of the things that we have going for us right now, there's a window of opportunity is that we have relatively low interest rates in comparison to inflation. So right now, the 10 year treasury on ballpark, and I saw it today, it was about three, let's call it three, two, three point two percent on the 10 year treasury. Inflation is eight point six plus or minus. If, if you believe them, right? But let's say you believe them, 8.6. So the, the delta between there, I'm gonna do some quick math. It's, you know, let's call it, let's call it five and change percent. Okay, close enough. 5%, that's, that's the window of where we're borrowing relative to what inflation is. The last time we saw that, the delta being that wide was 1974. We have not seen it that wide since then. Wow. And so we've got an opportunity right now to lock in relatively, low interest rates for a pretty darn long period of time, 10 year fixed interest rates in many cases. And if you're buying some bigger apartments, you can go much longer than that. Um, and we've got inflation kicking in, which means the cost to duplicate your vacant building down the street is up significantly. The cost to build anything very high. So I think what we're going to see happen over a period of time is some of these, some of these really good opportunities that are exist right now in the environment be be catapulted up in value because of ultimately inflation that's taking place that are just kicking in. Everything's just going to be more expensive, including one's rent. 
So on a sliding scale from the offices being down here at the low low side yeah. right now, what's at the high side? In terms of demand? And in, in terms of demand, in terms of, of, of maybe, it e I guess, would it be even easier to put the, the deal together if it's a higher demand? Uh, it'd be easier to put a deal together in higher demand because the, the money is typically a little easier to borrow when it, when the assets stabilized, meaning okay. generally speaking over over 80 percent uh, occupied or economic occupancy. Uh, apartments, our apartments are going to be at the highest level right now. Is You know, that's why that is, John, because the federal government has deemed it to be in the, the government's best interest to provide housing. That If we have a strong housing, that home ownership is really strong that that so is the economy and so what you see on the home ownership side is government backed loans everything's fanny fanny freddie underwritten and so what they coincidentally you have uh fanny freddie or fanny underwriting and loans available on the apartment side so they want housing and the, the federal government will push housing by providing a whole bunch of underwriting or a whole bunch of uh, loans and in a liquidity market on the apartment side so at what size um would you say uh like a an, from an apartment or multifamily let's even say yeah. at what size do you start saying this is the size or the number of units you should start looking for oh okay. good question yeah you know what i always tie that back to everybody's personal goal what, what do you what are you really after for us it's oftentimes you know our line in the sand is it has to meet so much cash flow because I'm not interested in doing, you know, doing something for, uh, you know, make up a number, something small, just a few hundred dollars a month, like a single family would yield. We need a, we need a much greater strength than that. So I'm looking for something bigger. You know, what, what I do is I teach folks how to buy off market mom and pop commercial property, whether it's apartments, whether it's stealth storage, mobile home parks, industrial, which has been great right now, uh, or offices, right? Flex property as well. Anywhere from a million to $10 million. But that sweet spot's really a million to $5 million, independent of number of units, because you can go out in, in California or in my backyard in Des Moines, Iowa, the price per unit could be very, very different, right? So you can spend a whole lot uh, more money there, but we're looking at rates of return and how much cash flow we're yielding a month. To, so at the end of the day, it comes back to our personal goals. What are we trying to accomplish? You know, for, for the people I teach and, and train, it's the goal really first and foremost should be financial freedom. Because once you can get to a spot where you're no longer trading your time for your dollars, true freedom exists there. Because then you can decide how in the world, what were you put on this planet for? We've accomplished the goal of money. And now we get all our time back to decide how we want to spend that. So that leads me to the question, how, how what's the difference between um, the money that you can make on a, um, let's say flipping houses, for example, because so many people watching this right now, probably flipping houses, flipping land, they're flipping stuff, they're wholesaling stuff. Um, what's the difference money-wise between that and the commercial? What, where's that difference at? Yeah, literally, that's why we call it, that's why I call, you know, I've got a five-day challenge coming up. We call it the 20X Profit Challenge because literally it's 20 times. That's how much more, in many cases, you even want to scale it higher and again, I'm not being uh, cheeky. Like I keep going, Grant Cardone, a little cheeky. You know, I'm not telling people to go work 20 times harder. In fact, I'm anti Cardone. I want you to work less. We just employ the power of scale because instead of one house we're going to flip for a couple hundred grand, you can literally flip a commercial property for two million dollars. We can just move up and we can multiply our profits at the same time. You're already you're already doing the work. This is what I found when I got into this. All those Eeyore thoughts that I had. When I did my first deal, it became so much easier. When I did my second deal, it was like, it was like I found, it was like I found it. All the things that I've been searching for in real estate, this this pot, you know, pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, if you will. I was able to find it because all the things I had ever done, the the wholesaling, the fixing, the flipping, the rental, the management of third-party property managers in in single family. All those things just get employed the same in a very similar way in commercial. I already had all the skill set. I just didn't know it. So you, uh, I know you've got the um, the five day workshop coming up next week, and um, in that you basically are doing what for the people attending? Yeah. 
So we call it our, our five day 20 X profit challenge. And what we do over the course of five days is we get people to identify, you know, what asset class should they be going after? I teach them how to get the phone to ring. So what I call the, the hundred thousand dollar perfect seller. So how do we go find these sellers? It's not exactly the same as finding single family owners or finding, you know, landowners. How do we get them? How do we reach out to them? How do we get the phone to ring? Then how do we use this, what I call our capital multiplier quadrant? How do we know if we've got an opportunity? Because what I teach is, John, is the ability to reduce our risk and maximize our gain. Because if you just wanted to go buy a property that produced a, say, make up a number 5% return, you can just go to LoopNet or Crexy right now and just go find one and buy it. But that's not what I teach. I teach people how to multiply their capital. I want minimal risk and maximum return in a deal. So that's what I teach them. And we do that in the quadrant by narrowing down these deals. That And then I, I show them how to price it up. What, what do you even pay for a deal? So once you, once you think you've got a deal, what do we pay for it to lock in our profit? And then what paperwork do you actually use to lock it up? So I literally give people my paperwork, the exact paperwork I use, so they can go out and lock up a deal. So even if you know nothing about commercial, over the course of the week, you'll be able to identify the asset class you want to go after, how to find the seller, how to sift and sort through all the opportunities you'll get to know that you're spending your time actually doing deals, what to pay for a property, and then how to lock it up. Wow. And, and all that's for free? 100% free, yeah. Yep. Amazing. So if somebody locks up a deal, uh, can you help them out as far as that? And, and maybe uh, do you wholesale? Can, can you take a wholesale deal off of somebody who finds a great deal? Yep. No, that's a good question. So what happens, you know, if somebody locks up a deal, what are their options, right? Well, naturally, they can go, they can go close the deal. If you really want to take it down, you want to close it yourself, excellent. I'll point you on the right path to be able to do that. You want to partner the deal? Um, occasionally, I, I make my... I cut my chops, right? I make my money doing deals. And so I love doing deals. So oftentimes I'll partner with somebody, I'll bring money or all the money to the deal. And, you know, once in a while, somebody just goes, you know, I just want to, I just want to pay day. I just want a cash infusion so I can stack some cash to be able to do whatever it is I want to do next. Great. I may just buy it from you. I may just, you may just be able to wholesale it for me, or maybe we can wholesale it together. So we've got an option there as well. You know, I recently heard about you doing a deal with uh, one, of, one of the students. Um, oh, yeah that uh was a storage unit could you share that story with us i thought it was just amazing fascinating yeah yeah, yeah. so i connected uh i connect with gave my partner on that one and he ended up finding the the opportunity so he's out of indianapolis indiana submarket there and we it was a self-storage unit 151 units and there was also about, I'm going to say a few acres in the back of this property so that we could add about, I'm rounding, 200 additional units. And this one, we were able to ne negotiate seller financing on this. Got to love seller financing, right? I no, love that. Yeah. So the seller wanted cash flow. He didn't want cash. He wanted cash flow. He's at the, a point where he owned this building for about a decade. And he just literally, all he wanted the guy wanted to do was sell his boat in the Gulf of Mexico. Had a boat down there and he just wanted time. And so he wanted to be the bank in this scenario. And so what we agreed to is put on $1.4 million purchase, we put $200,000 down and seller financed the rest at 5% interest only, 5% interest only for 20 years. Wow. And so and then what I did was sweeten the deal for us because I wanted to make sure we had some optionality there in the event we ever sold the property. Seller didn't want to get paid off. So in the event we sold the property, seller financing stays with the property. So the next buyer who comes in can retain that seller financing. Or we've got the option that if we sold the property and we went and bought another property, the seller financing would come with us to the next property. So it becomes my private lender at 5% interest only for 20 years. Oh, nice. That's a nice way to kind of guarantee somebody the, the payment stream. It's great. Well, think about it from the seller's perspective. Nobody knows this property better than him. Right. So his comfort level is, you know, you get to get get some money down and it's backed by the property. The property already knows. OK, so a lot of people listening to this don't have two hundred thousand dollars. So how yeah. how is that taken care of? Yeah. Good question. On that yeah, deal. Okay. Yeah. On that scenario, I like the deal so much. I like the partner so much um, that I funded 100 percent of the whole thing. And we ended up becoming 50 50 partners on the thing. OK, so. Um, 
And I assume there's other sources for like that's uh, gap funding that you kind of need sometimes on these deals. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. There's multiple ways to skin that cat, if you will. And it really just depends what what one's goal is. Right. Yeah. If the right. goal is, you know, for some people, I run into people and they're like, I just want to I want to wholesale at a bigger level. I want to for some folks, it's I want to wholesale so I can stack a few hundred thousand dollars and then go buy a property. Wonderful. There's an absolute there's a there's a tremendous there's a tremendous outlet to that um, to be able to do it. And we've done it multiple times. We still do it. We're in the we're in the middle of uh, a transaction right now. We got going. It'll be our. Uh, I'm gonna. I'm gonna. I'm gonna not jinx it. We're in the middle of due diligence. We're coming to the tail end in about seven days, and we've got a closing set for. I think we're in mid October on that. It'll be our biggest one we've ever done, and wow. so I will share that with you at a later point in time. Okay. Well, I've seen the software, and because I, I, I I'm not a software guy, and I love looking at software. And I create and build software all the time and, and have for many years, going all the way back to I don't know, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even want to mention the name, the yeah. number. But, but um, what I found fascinating about your software that you created, uh, one, it's easy to run because it runs inside of an Excel program. Right. But it kind of does all the work for you. So you can take the information you get from a seller and just plug it in. It's not that many. I, I think I I do more on a house than I do on some on on the software. So, right? Can you tell us a little bit more about how that works and yeah. why yeah. that's so great for a person? You know, just start, especially if you're there starting and yeah. you don't know all these key, uh, you know, metrics that you kind of need to know for correct. For, yeah. Well, there's two there's two core um, Excel program software side that we that we run. One is the Capital Multiplier Quadrant. And simply what we do, John, is just go get a handful of piece of information. So uh, rent, what's current rent, what's the market rent and vacancy. What's the current vacancy? What's the market vacancy? We just get four different data points. They're easy to get. And I just show people where to get it, how to get it. And we punch it in. And do you remember uh, I, I came up with this from literally I, I'm, I'm in my home office now. And I look to my left one day and Robert Kiyosaki's book, um, Cash flow quadrant, just right. literally, I mean, it pra not literally, but it practically jumped off the shelf. I mean, that's all the only book I saw out of hundreds of books on my bookshelf. And ultimately, that's how I came up with this quadrant. You remember that? You remember that book? Yes, I do. The ESBI, yeah. you know, he, he talked about the whole thing and where you want to be in the quadrant. Well, in, in our quadrant, essentially, it just becomes red light, yellow light, green light. We map out in a quadrant based on those four pieces of data. Do we have an opportunity or do we not? Yeah. And from there, literally just from an early, easy initial phone call conversation with a seller, we can get the information, plug it into our quadrant and then make a decision. Is this something we want to spend more time with, with the seller? Or is this something we want to discard, send back, you know, pass on so that all our competition can go beat their heads against the wall, spending endless <laughs> hours in and up analyzing and overanalyzing to get to a point where they're not going to do a deal anyway, because it wasn't a deal to begin with. You know what I liked about that is that you don't have to know why you just have to plug the numbers in sure. and it does it for you because if you if you have to get to the why sometimes now you got to go get a, even more educated and understand you know the steps that you got to walk through a commercial whereas the software does it for you and you don't as a beginner you don't you don't even know what you don't know you don't know so, what you don't know yeah, this correct. takes care of that. I, that's what I found fascinating. I thought everybody getting into commercial needs to use this software uh, because it just takes all of that guesswork and not, not knowing what you don't know out of the equation. Correct. And then you yeah. get to the next level. So so we get past, okay, is this uh, a deal that we should be looking at, right? right? Now we get to the second stage. Now, what does that stage do for everybody? Yeah, at that point, you're like, all right, cool. It's a deal we need to be looking at. We start, we get the information that we're going to need, and then we punch it into what we call our easy eval spreadsheet. And that ultimately, that means what do we pay for a deal? From there, we just make some decisions early on. And, and this is why I said to you earlier, you know, when somebody asks me something, I often ask them, what do you want out of this? And that's what that's where we start in the spreadsheet. What do we want? What are our required returns? Because if we narrow our focus down to go, we only buy deals that meet this criteria, we just have our blinders on. Everything else gets discarded. 
we can spend our time, energy, effort actually doing deals. It's so much easier when you know where you're going to be able to actually get there. And so that's the first thing we do is decide on that. And then we simply just take the seller's information and we punch it in there. Then from there, we make a couple of inputs on, you know, for something like self-storage, for example. You know, what we have done is drawn from some of the nation's largest surveys that have been done across the country, have, have been broken it into zones to decide what is an average operating expense for the section of the country in which the property is at. So what we do is take the seller's information, see how they operate it. We match the overlay that with how should an average operator, well, how should this property av on average operate? And then we put the numbers together there and it ultimately it spits out literally a red light or green light. Red light or green light, that, yeah. I also noticed that it also can basically spit out the price you should be paying for it. And you it's know a, right away if they're overpriced. You're exactly right. So red light, green light, does it meet our return criteria? And if if not, we simply just play with the price until we get a green light. So we know exactly what we need to pay in order to meet our financial criteria to go into a deal. And at that price, okay, at that price, if you, I mean, you basically, you have a deal. You have a deal that almost any investor would want to step up and put money into, and even a bank will want to come in and put money into something like that. Is that right? Yeah, you, you absolutely have got an opportunity to be able to move forward. And for us, it is literally at that point, it, it's, we go straight under contract. We've got the information from the seller. They've told us that this is what it is. Perfect. We're going to rely on that to be able to make a decision. And then we are punching our information in my office, and then we go straight to an agreement. We literally make an offer at that point in time. So I know a, a lot of people, especially, um, you know, they're, they're, they're being taught, oh, use an LOI, a letter of intent. Oh, yeah. But you don't, you don't even kind of waste your time with a letter of intent unless you're like forced to by a broker. Is that right? Correct. Yeah. A letter of intent at its core is just an agreement to agree. And right. it's non-binding. I don't, I mean, would you buy a house, John, or a piece of land? With no. a letter of I mean, no. you know why? Because first you can't because a letter of intent is not, an, not a purchase agreement. You can't close with the letter of intent. You actually need a purchase agreement. Yeah. We, need a, we need a contract. Yeah. And so, yes, I want to get to a contract. That way we can make a decision. If I you know, want to wholesale it, sell it to somebody else, close on it, whatever the decision is, it doesn't really matter. But you, you need that uh, contract. You need that contract. Agreement. And yes. so uh, in this five-day challenge, and I want to run, I want to uh, – I want to go ahead and put up some information on that for next week. Oh, yeah. uh, you're including the contract in as well. Is that right? That Correct. You yeah, the, the exact one we use to be able to lock property up and it's it, lock it up risk free too, John. So I show people, you know, it, unlike a whole house is in many cases where, you know, you're, you're, your period to go cancel a contract or do due diligence or go sell that if you're going to wholesale somebody else's like seven days, like no time. Like we don't have that. I'm talking about 60 or 90 days for us to execute on our business plan, whatever that plan is, wholesale it, wholesale it, close on it. We've got plenty of time to be able to do that. So I show them how to lock that up risk free. Yeah. And you've got it there. It's a, it's a five day challenge. It starts on September 19th okay. at 20 X profit event dot com is, is where you sign up totally free we will open this up for questions we're just about uh finished up for the for the podcast but if you have questions uh, i'm seeing uh, people in here hi alma i see you cecil i see you claudette uh, everybody's kind of like coming in All if right. uh, you have any questions for neil now's the time to do it and uh we'll, we'll get those questions to him before we uh, wrap up uh neil what is what would you say in your opinion uh, is the thing that most home flippers miss about commercial or maybe they're not, not seeing something or what is that that's missing that keeps so many of them out of commercial? Uh, you know what the number one thing is? What? They don't think they can do it. They just don't. There's nothing else. They just don't think they can do it. You know, I think so many of us, you know, all of us grew up in a house, a condo, an apartment, a townhouse, right? We all grow up living someplace. So, for us to be able to buy a house, the leap is not that great because we all grew up in and around this whole thing. But not not many of us grew up, you know, cutting our teeth in apartment complexes or in self storage units or in a mobile home park. And so I think that's the leap. And you know what? I, I mean, I've been there. 
I, those are the same exact thoughts I had. And when I, I just knew that what I was doing wasn't going to get me to where I wanted to go. And let me be, John, I'll be candid. Uh, we still flip houses. It's a great cash business for us to generate cash. We, I got this thing practical on autopilot. I work with one contractor. We've done a hundred plus transactions at this point, with the same contractor. If, if I, I, I have, in fact, I walked the house about two weeks ago. I called my carpet guy. I go, dude, the carpet looks so bad. I said, you got to change this. I and mean, this is, this is not the carpet we've been using. He said, Neil, I've used this in the last seven houses. You haven't been to these houses, man. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that tells you, we just, we have it down so much that I just don't, I don't even go to the houses. They change carpet, didn't even tell me. Yeah. Um, so, so you're so, using that as your cash flow, like so I added it. cash flow. Your commercial yeah. is for long term, yeah. a generational income, I take it. Yeah. I work, I, yeah. Work for the assets, let the asset work for you. And so that's the goal on the commercial side is I want to put the asset in place and let this thing work. John, three and a half years after I bought my very first commercial property, I became financially free on only be, solely because of the commercial property, which I had acquired over that three and a half year period. I, I couldn't, I didn't get there in single families. Fix and flip is never going to get you there. I'm not knocking it, but it's a, it's a cash business. It's a J-O-B. It is. You just gotta you gotta employ it someplace else and you gotta wake up it. next the next month and start all over again. Correct. Yeah. yeah. You know, even on notes, because I push notes a lot because I love notes because Absolutely. they can pay out. The problem with notes is that that's the problem. They pay out at some yeah. point. It's not, you know, it could be years, but it's not long, it's not never long enough. Uh, you know, that that's why I uh, you know want to bring you on, share with everybody that I know of uh, that's connected to me in any way, what you've put together, because I've seen it, I've seen your software, I've seen your program. Uh, I'm thoroughly impressed. I've seen other people's, but I'm gonna tell you, if I had anyone to send to to learn this business, I would send them to you, Neil, because I know they're in good hands and they're gonna get the education they need. And they don't need to spend, you know, six months learning all the ins and outs because you've taken all of that out of the equation and kind of made it like, okay, fill in this software and you've either got a deal or you don't, you know what the price is and the money's there because you're going to be there to support them as well. I yeah, love it. No, I, it, it really means a lot coming from your mind. I, thank you. We, I try really hard to simplify things and sometimes trying to get, trying to make things simple is complicated, uh, <laughs> but it, to make it as easy as you possibly can, because there's a lot that there's a lot that can overwhelm people. And I think that's, you know, past somebody not being able, not seeing themselves doing that, it's that they just feel like they're overwhelmed. They get overwhelmed. They just don't have a clear and direct path to be able to get there. And that's what we've I've strived really hard to do is to create that clear and direct path to be able to go. You don't need to know everything. Just need to know what the next step is. Just take action. The next step. Make sure you I'll make sure you're set up where you don't put yourself at risk, where we don't have credit on the line, where we don't have dollars and cents on the line, just take the next step and we can learn as we go and you're protected along the way. And then eventually we can make a decision. Is it a deal? Is it not a deal? And if it's a deal, great. Now, how do we move forward? What does that look like? Perfect. Do you have any last words before we uh, sign off today? No, I, I think, you know, I, I see a question here. I get often asked this about asset classes, and I'll kind of talk around that. Um, I always bill myself. I'm asset class agnostic. <laughs> if a good deal fell, I mean, yeah, I think, you know, if a, if a 2020 Corvette fell in your lap that was a good deal, wouldn't you buy it? Yes. Yeah. I mean, I just happen to feel the same about real estate. I, I focus in my backyard to leverage your relationships that, that I have and a track record of knowing people in the city and driving by real estate all the time everywhere just knowing the city physically it's my intent to leverage those and it has proved extraordinarily well for me and i encourage and that, that's really what it is it's an encouragement of what asset class is best it's the one that you like the one that you enjoy the one that you know something about i get people focused in don't do what i do until you get to a point where i'm at focus on one we just start with one asset class, get to know it super well, and then we can grow later. But, you know, the man that catches two rabbits catches none, right? So we just focus in and, and get moving along until we get to the next step. So I know I'm, I'm super excited about the, 
the five day challenge. It's the last one we're doing this year. John, you were at the first one and, uh, and, you were so ex- and I appreciate that. You were so excited. I know you told a lot of people uh, about it and they, they came to the second one. And I'm, I'm grateful because we had a lot of really good people in the group from, uh, from who you shared it with. So uh, I know, I know you carry a uh, good company, so I'd be excited to see anybody else uh, from that that's connected to you to be involved in there. And it seemed like the, the folks connected to you, I'm telling you, they're super sharp. They ask really good questions, very thoughtful, very methodical. Um, really talented group of folks. So I'm, I'm excited yeah. to be here with you and, and chatting with your folks and your, and your team. Yeah, they are a amazing group. I yeah. mean, they, you know, we've over the years, you know, and over the years you filter through a lot of people and then, and then the people that show up and they, uh, you know, that the see, they, the, there's certain people that see opportunity yeah. and yeah. they just, they gravitate in and they're, they, they participate. And then you, you actually are seeing them, uh, in that second challenge you did stepping up because these guys are action takers i mean they're all out there flipping yes. land and everything else and uh so they're ready for hey what else can we do you know we got this land thing down what else is on the plate and yes yeah. oh you know what that's bring them. i'm glad you mentioned just that you hit a chord with me um you know you can stack this on your business this is what i did stack it on top of your business you already have a successful business you want another avenue or an avenue for forever cash this is what stacks on top. You don't have to quit what you're doing. Dear God, don't quit what you're doing. Keep doing more of what you're doing that already works. Just stack this on top. Make it a goal. And it could, the goal could be as simple as, you know, I want to buy one property, one commercial property in the next year. It's a terrific goal. And it's, it's you can absolutely accomplish, you can more than accomplish that. So it's, it's an easy one to, to do. Just stack it right on top. Yeah, stack it. And then it's there creating that cash. That's a cash Correct. machine every month forever. Yeah, yes. that's why I love it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, I look forward to. You. I'm gonna I'm gonna jump back in on this next one too. I every time I uh, have have seen this, I I pick up more and more every time you do them. And I know you're always improving and yeah. in, and even improving your software. I mean, you ne- you just don't stop, which I love. And uh, so I'll see you myself next week, uh, along with uh, everybody else who's gonna jump in on this with us. Uh, it's free. And you are going to get more than you bargained for because, I mean, even though it's free, I I would like say, you know, I've seen stuff that, that sold for $9.97, a thousand bucks that gives you less than what you're giving free for the full week. It's amazing. So I look yeah. forward to it. I'm excited. I'm excited to see you there. I appreciate you having me on. All right. Good night. And good night, everybody. We'll see you next time. Thanks, Neil. Thanks, John.